picks. If you uh, want to join me there, that would be very, very cool. And here's the big idea, the bottom line up front for our message today is this. When your world is being ripped apart, when your world is being ripped apart, remember you have a refuge. You have a refuge. I just uh, appreciate the worship, worship team putting that song together. That's a really old song that really means a lot to me. And one of my favorite hymns of, of all time. You know, songs are just powerful, aren't they? You know, they're really powerful. I remember when um, I broke up with my very first girl, well, she broke up with me, just for the record. My very first girlfriend, um, it was sad, okay? It was really sad. And my friend brought me a cassette tape with air supply on it. Yeah. Yeah, some of you are old enough to know what I'm talking about. Um, and, man, I just listened to that tape over and over and over and I, I don't know, I kept spiraling. It was a bad, it was a bad day. Um, but then someone, the brand, a brand new Chicago album came out, and I just remember Peter Cetera singing, everybody needs a little time away. And I was just like, he's singing my life, you know? I mean, it was just, it moved me. Psalms is a book, it's a collection of songs, and we're going to look at one of these songs today. And there's a purpose in these songs. Sometimes they are to remind us of something. Sometimes their cause is to cause us to reflect on something, right? And, and, and these songs have power to them. And we're going to look at one of those today. But before we do that, I just want to take you a little walk through history, okay? It may sound familiar, but don't make any assumptions, okay? Everyone had thought the pandemic was over. I mean, all the reports were that everything had died down. It had been 10 years since there had been an outbreak. And yes, 25 million people had died, but it seemed like everyone was in the clear. It seemed like we'd moved on to a new time in history. There was a period of a bit of optimism, and, and everyone seemed to think that life was getting back to normal. But then it revisited the town. The head of the monastery or the university, which was the biggest employer in town, contacted all the employees and said to the employees, you need to run. Contacted all of his staff and said, you need to go. You need to get out of here. You need to get away from this. This is deadly. But one professor chose to stay. He decided that nothing could cause him to leave his hometown except for the will of God. One professor Remained On August 19th, which was just 17 days into this renewed pandemic, there was the 19th death in this little town. In fact, it had reached his best friend's wife. She was pregnant, expecting a child, and she was taken by the pandemic. A deacon in his church, his wife also had passed away. Now his son John is sick as well. His wife Katie is expecting their second child. And everything inside him said to him it was time to run. But this professor chose not to run because he had a refuge to remain in. He wrote a letter to his good friend Justice. And this is what he said. I'm concerned about the delivery of my wife. His wife wasn't being delivered by UPS. He's talking about, you know, his, his baby being born. So greatly the example of the deacon's wife has terrified me. But listen, but he who is mighty will provide. For he has done great things for me. And the great things that he has done hath given me endurance. Now listen, may my Christ, whom I've purely taught and purely confessed, be my refuge and my strength. My little John cannot now send his greetings to you because of his illness. He desires your prayers for him. Today is the 12th day of his illness and he's somehow been sustained by liquids only. He's trying to eat but he can't. Yet it's wonderful to see his little body, his little infant body wanting to be strong and happy but he cannot. We hope for the end of this plague. Farewell. Give a kiss to your son, a hug to your mother, and remember us in your prayers. But remember most, God is our refuge. 
I want to draw your attention to the words right in the middle of this. May Christ, whom I have purely confessed and taught. Remember, he was a Bible teacher. He was a professor. May Christ, who I've purely confessed. His confession came before his confidence. And I want you to see, before a calamitous catastrophe hits your life, you must have a confident confession upon whom you stand, whom you will rely upon to protect you in the dangerous hour. And even if the calamitous con uh, catastrophe comes against you, if you have this confident confession, we'll see in our text today, this will have a calming influence in your life. For listen, when you are behind the walls of a strong tower, when you are safe and secure in a fortress, when you are surrounded by the strong arm of God, there is nothing in this world that can destroy or defeat you. Now listen, in course to this professor, a daughter was born and he wrote letters to his friends saying, my dearest Elizabeth, is so weak and so frail, yet the joy of my life. Unfortunately, she only lived seven months before she gave way to the pandemic. His wife survived, his son recovered, but he was never well again. They struggled throughout their life. The year, 1527. The country, Germany. The city, Wittenberg. The professor, Martin Luther. The pandemic was the bubonic plague or the black death, and my wife asked very strenuously that I not describe the black death for you. If you have small children, don't do this, but you can Google images of what the black plague looked like. It was not a fun way to die. Sometime after all these events had taken place, in fact, two years after all these events had taken place, Martin Luther got out a pen and he paraphrased the psalm of our consideration today. And he wrote the words, a mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. What's so interesting about this is Psalm 46 was always Martin Luther's favorite psalm. In fact, for years when he and his good friend Philip Melanchthon would get together and when they were working in the ministry and they were striving to move forward with this brand new transition out of this old dead religion into something new and vibrant, something that was based on a relationship with God and not just religious deeds and activities, when the two of them would get together and they felt like everything was coming against them, Martin Luther would say to his friend Philip Melanchthon, let us sing of our refuge and let the devil do his best. And so for years, these verses that we'll look at today were a uh, supporting strength, no matter what came against him. The words written originally in German, the sentiment of our song is taken right from Psalm 46. And before I break all of this down, I just stole today off of YouTube. I have no copyright permission for, to do what I did today, but I stole a video today of these words and this song. You can remain seating. God's okay with you sitting while you sing, okay? But we're going to cue the video, and I'd like for you to just join me in singing this song before we get into the text today. Can you do that for me? All right, hit it. Oh 
listen, a lot of people have called the period of time that Martin Luther lived in the time of the Reformation. And there was a day before this song was written. I mean, because that, that song stands up after 400 years, doesn't it? I mean, it still stands up. But he had gone to the uh, place there in Wittenberg, and, and he had written down 95 things that, that he just saw that were wrong in the church. And, and listen, when he nailed those up, there was a spark that went. And something began to change in the world. You see, it all began not with just a spark of the Reformation. It began with a spark of repentance in Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King. I saw a statue of Martin Luther King yesterday with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was walking through the forest one night, and, and he had a terrifying experience, and he asked God to let him live, and he went back to his house, and he, he began to open the Bible and look to see what was in there, and, and he went to Habakkuk, of all places, chapter 2 and 24, and it simply said this, the just shall live by faith. Now, that may not sound that revolutionary to you, but in a world that was built on man-made religion, this was absolutely earth-shattering. And he began to look at the church that he served and everything that was going on. And he couldn't see anything that was right. And so he nailed these theses on the, the, wall, uh, the door there in Wittenberg in 15 and 21. And now he began to incredibly be persecuted. Not just he, but over the years that followed, there were literally thousands of people who were burned at the stake for simply turning their back on dead religion and entering into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And this song has been called the battle hymn of the Reformation. But I'm here to argue that it wasn't the battle hymn of the Reformation. It's the battle hymn of a man that was reformed. And he was reformed by this, that he realized no matter what this world can throw at you, in Jesus Christ we have a safe place that we can run to even when the world is being ripped apart. Here's the first thing that I want you to see in our text today. The first thing that I want you to see in our text today. Listen, this song is a song in the scripture. The book of Psalms literally means songs, okay? And so if you look at Psalm in, in chapter 46, I'm going to break it down just a little bit because we'll spend three out of the next four weeks dealing with this. If you look at it, notice what it says, please. It says at the beginning, to the choir master. In other words, this is instructions to the choir at church. And then it says, according to Alamoth. Now, this is interesting. This is an ancient Aramaic word, and it literally means basically what we call sopranos today. This is a song that was to be sung by the women. All right? It was a vocal part for the women. Look who it was written by. It wasn't written by David. It was written by the sons of Korah. And then it says there, a song, simply a song. And so this was a song to be sung in the tabernacle by female voices to remind them that when your world is being ripped apart, there is a refuge. Now one more thing that I want to draw your attention to. If you look down through Psalm 46, you'll see the word Selah three times. And again, we don't know an exact translation of this world. It, it kind of baffles scholars a little bit, but it appears to be a musical term. And this term literally means pause. And so through the development of this song, there was a time when the voices would stop and people would reflect on the words that they had just sung. And this is what we're going to do for three sermons. We're going to pause and reflect. And there's three things that we'll see in this sermon. They come right out of the three stanzas of this ancient psalm. Number one, we need to remember there is a refuge. That's going to be today. Remember there is a refuge. And then we're going to look next time at remember there is a river. And I'll explain all of that when we get to it. There is a river. And then the week following when I preach again, we're going to look at this third idea. Remember there is a reason. There is a reason. Come let us reason. There's going to be a reason given. Okay? So that's the outline of the next couple of weeks. So let's look at this text. Number one. Here's the big thing I need you to see. There is in the sons of Korah a confident confession. There is a confident confession. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Now Martin Luther, he paraphrased this, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. 
a few things I want you to see. And by confession, what, what, you know, we, we've made confession something that you do when you're in trouble, right? You confess to the police. You confess to your parents. You confess to your spouse that you ate the last cookie last night even though you said you did. Whatever it is, you know. There's confessions. This isn't the kind of confession. This is just a bold declaration of truth. This is just speaking forth that which is true. Okay? And so a couple things about this confession. Number one, it is a personal confession. It is a personal confession. He doesn't say your God. He doesn't say some gods. He doesn't say another God. He says our God. It is a personal confession. Second, I want you to see it is a powerful confession. He says our God is a refuge. Now for us, you know, I want you to think of this as more than just a storm shelter. More than just a storm shelter. I, uh, did, did, were there storms here this morning? Any of you experienced anything? A little bit, a little flashy, bangy, boomy stuff. My dog hates flashy, bangy, boomy stuff. But I want you to know my dog is, is just, she, she follows directions to, I don't know how she learned this lesson, right? But she hates flashy, boomy things. So when I woke up this morning, I went out to take her on her walkie walk and she wasn't where she's supposed to be sleeping. And I looked on the couch where she's not supposed to be sleeping and she's not there. And I looked at the bedroom doors and we had those closed so she wasn't sleeping where she wasn't supposed to be sleeping. I didn't know where to find her. So you know what I did? I went into the bathroom a little bit, uh, the, the, the main bathroom, and I went into that bathroom. You know where she was? She was in the tub hiding. She literally got into her storm shelter. Now I'm thinking to myself, you know, if the winds really ripped the place apart, I don't know how safe you are in the tub, but at least you can wash up when, you know, the storm's done with you. But, I mean, she literally went into, like, her little storm shelter. She was shaking like a leaf, and, and she was just terrified. But I want you to understand, this is more than just getting, you know, to the lowest floor or, or getting into an inner room or, or putting a mattress or a bike helmet over your head, you know, because there's a storm coming. I'm talking literally about a refuge that was a strong tower. It was a tower that was built built to defend against an oncoming armory. It was a place that would sustain a siege. It was a place of provision and protection. This isn't just some little place. It's huge. It'd be the biggest part of the city except for the palace. And when the enemies would come against, when the enemies would march against, the entire community would have a place to run. It is a powerful confession. And I want you to know our God is big enough that no matter what it is you are facing today in your private life, in your personal life, in your work life, in your financial life, in your family, whatever it is that you are facing, God is big enough to be your refuge. He is a strong tower. Not only is this personal and not only is this powerful, look what our text says. It is a present confession. He says, our God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. It's a present confession. And what do I mean by this? Sometimes when we're in the midst of all of it and all things are absolutely chaotic, when there's calamity and catastrophe all around us, the first question we ask is, where is God in all of this? You know where he is? He's right in the middle of it with you. No matter how strong the storm, no matter how alone you feel, God needs you to know today you are not forgotten. You are not forsaken. You are always at the center of his attention. He is a very present. Have you ever been in like a dialogue with somebody and you wonder, I know you're there, but are you really there? And you're talking away and you're just wondering like, are we connecting you know, I know you're not in your head, but are you really engaged? Listen, God is completely and entirely engaged in whatever it is you're facing. He's not distracted by trying to hold the universe together that he can't care for the concerns of your heart. He is literally engaged in the minutest details of your life. Driving in today, I heard the song, His Eye is on a Sparrow. Can I get a witness, old timers? His Eye is on the Sparrow. It was an old gospel quartet. I don't even know how I got on the channel. His Eye is on the Sparrow. And I know if he's watching after the Sparrow, right, he's watching after me. God is a very present refuge. But I want you to see this is also a prior confession. This is a prior confession. What I mean by this is he makes this confession 
before the bad stuff really happens. We haven't even gotten to the bad stuff yet. Right? We're going to see in a minute that, that the waters are roaring and the mountains are sliding into the sea and everything is falling apart. But before all of that happens, he makes a prior confession. My God is my fortress. He is my strong tower. He is a very present help in time of trouble. My friends, I want you to see this example was set by Martin Luther so perfectly well. Before he nailed his 95 theses there on the Wittenberg door, God was his refuge. Before he was taken before the Diet of Worms a few years later, I want you to know God was his confession. Before all of his friends began to be burned at the stake and tortured, God was his refuge. I want you to see before George's wife died, before his wife delivered Elizabeth, before Elizabeth died, before Jonathan was cured, before all these things happened, he had already determined and God was his refuge. It was a prior confession. And so much of what we do today is reactionary. We wait until we're in the midst of a mess and then we look for a solution. Friends, you can stand today on the rock that is Jesus Christ. You can stand on it right now. It's not shifting sand. It's not sliding into the sea. It's not caving away. It's not crumbling. It's not shaking. You can stand firm on Jesus Christ today. Now listen, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood. You see, there was, in Martin Luther, there was catastrophe coming. There was catastrophe coming. And we see it in the sons of Korah as well. Continue with me into verse 2. It says, though, therefore, therefore, we will not fear. Because of his prior confession, because of that personal confession, that powerful confession, because of all these things, he was able to say, therefore, based on these things, we will not fear. This leads us to our second point today. The second point today is this. When you have a confident confession, there is a calming consequence. There is a calming consequence. Do you need a little bit of calm in your world? The rest of you are just liars. I need some calm. I need, like, my life surrounded by, like, lavender and sweet-smelling things and soft and cuddly things. I need a little bit of calm in my life. And I'm sure that you do today. We all need a calming confidence. So where do you run when your world is being ripped apart? How do you bring calm back into your life? Do you run to the bottle? Do you run to the needle? Do you run to the pill? Do you run to pop psychology? Do you run to the wisdom of the internet? Do you run to Twitter to solve the problems in your life? Do you run to Dr. Phil and Oprah and all these? Where do you run? I run to my refuge. And once inside, there is a calming consequence. When your world is being ripped apart, the only refuge to run to is this. Verse 46, therefore we will not fear. Look what Martin Luther said. He says, will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. And I love this. This is so, it's just so descriptive. The prince of darkness grim. We tremble not at him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fail him. I was talking to somebody that's in the middle of it right now. I mean, they're just going through some stuff. It's not an easy road that they're walking right now, and maybe you're walking the same pathway that they are. At every turn, there's just pain. There is just devastation. And I was talking to them, and, and, and I just said, I just wish, I just wish that I could just like Jesus right now, just stand up and just say, peace be still over your life. And I can't. I don't have power or authority over the wind and the waves. But I said to them, because they don't know Jesus, I said, if you'll just run to Jesus, I promise you that he can speak peace over your life. Just a word. Peace. Be still. Remember the story. In the story, the disciples are like, good grief. We're drowning. 
The boat's fallen apart. We've never seen a storm like this. We've never been so scared, and we've lived our whole life on this body of water. We've never been so terrified, and Jesus, why are you sleeping in the back of the boat? You know why? Because it was no problem for Jesus. It was a rough ride for those in the boat, but it wasn't a problem for Jesus. I love it. I don't even think he was tired. I think he was just like, I'm just going to take a nap to illustrate for them that you can be calm in the midst of the storm if Jesus is in the boat with you. See, the biggest problem is we try and row and we try and paddle and we try and get to the other side. Jesus had already promised them they'd be delivered to the other side. He'd already told them that. He said, we're going to go to the other side. He already, he already knew that. And there he is in the boat. And listen, when Jesus is in the middle of your mess, it is no mess at all. Peace. Be still. A confident confession of the sure and sustaining power of Jesus Christ has a calming consequence. On your very worst day, remember this, God's never had a bad day. Now listen. If God is your refuge, if God is your strength, if God is your very present help in times of trouble, why would you run anywhere else? Why? I was talking to one of you this week, I forget who it was, but it doesn't matter. We were talking about the days when I was a little kid and we go to the farm and they were butchering chickens. And I was warned before I got there, these weren't the folks that like wrung the neck of the chicken, right? I mean, they took, they took it off. I'm sorry, children, to traumatize you. Your chicken nuggets came from a living creature. Go deal with that, parents. Okay. So I was there on the farm, and they put the chicken on the butcher block, you know, just a stump, and they took the head off, and that little critter ran after me. No, it wasn't funny. No. It was scary. And I'm like zigging and zagging. And I swear, it had a tracking device on it. It was locked and loaded. Now, it didn't last long. It felt like about three years as a kid, but it, it didn't last long. But I was terrified. Listen, that thing was spewing its insides all over, leaving a trail of trauma everywhere it went, zigging and zagging, and it's just like some of you because you're running around like chickens with your head cut off when all you need to do is run inside the refuge that is Jesus Christ and you'll find calm. Why would you run anywhere else? Anything you can put into your body is just going to numb it temporarily. And you're going to come right back and wake up and realize the pain hasn't gone away. You can try running from God to find solutions to your problems. And I'm telling you, you're only going to get in deeper mud. Why would you run anywhere else? Prince of darkness, grim. Ha, we tremble not for him. For lo, his doom is sure. His rage, we can't endure one little word. Will fell him. Finally, number three, and it's weird. It's really weird. Look at the confession and the calm precede the calamity. The confession and the calm precede the catastrophe. And I want you to know this isn't just accidental, like it's not just reflective. There was a fixed and fundamental decision that was made by the sons of Korah, that was made by Martin Luther himself, long before all the things we're going to look at right now began to happen. They had already prepared themselves for the battle that was coming. Look at the end of verse 2. It says, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, this is a bad day. Everything they can see is falling apart. Everything around them is failing. And what does Martin Luther tell us to do? Let goods, that's your stuff. Let kindred, that's your family. Let it go. And then he says, this mortal life also. Let go of your own life. Why? God's truth abideth still. And I never realized it until really digging into it this week. There's almost like there's a colon right here. 
like there's almost a colon. Uh, like was I was saying it as a kid because of where you pause, you're like, God's truth abides is still. And you're like, yeah, okay, amen, you know, let's go. But listen, he's about ready to tell you what God's truth is. What is God's truth? God's truth is this, his kingdom is forever. And whatever you're facing is temporary. It may feel like a permanent problem, but it's really just a temporary opportunity. You see, listen, the calamity in your life is just an opportunity for God to illustrate his sovereignty. The calamity in your life is just an opportunity for God to display his sovereignty. Now listen. Scholars have debated what sort of calamitous catastrophe had befallen the sons of Korah. It's a dire picture. It's a picture of the world being ripped apart. It's similar to what many of us are enduring today. It's very similar to what Martin Luther was enduring in his day. Nothing was right. Nothing seemed safe. Nothing felt secure. Everything's being ripped apart. The mountains that we used to stand on, they're now falling into the sea. The sea is all crazy. We used to swim in it, but now it's all over the place. We don't know exactly what it was, but I'm going to argue next week that I think I know what the sons of Korah were referring to. And I hope you come back for it because it's going to be really cool. Because in the midst of their world being ripped apart, God provided a river of provision. Not only did God serve as their protection, and I'm not going to spoil the sermon next week because I need you to come back. But I want you to see, not only was he their protection, he was also their provision. So when everything was falling apart, God provided them exactly what they needed. Now listen, I think Martin Luther got this right, and I think he understood what the sons of Korah were saying perfectly. When goods are being ripped away, my friends, the stuff you have is absolutely meaningless. That big fancy whatever it is you have... It ain't going to fit in your coffin. I've never, ever, ever seen a U-Haul trailer attached to a coffin. My friends, whatever it is in this life that you think is going to provide you safety and security. Listen, your job is about as secure as nothing right now in this world. Your finances are about as secure as nothing. Your retirement is about as secure as nothing right now. And if you haven't looked, don't look at your 401k this week. I promise you. Bad week on Wall Street. The very things that you think are so utterly important are completely meaningless in comparison to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Completely. It's just stuff. Now this next one's a little bit harder. How do I let my family go? My friends, I hope that you love your family passionately and dearly. I hope that you love them to the moon and back, as I often say to my girls. I hope that you do. But in comparison to your love of Jesus Christ, you got to let go of family. In comparison to your love of Jesus Christ, let it go. Let it go. I feel like I'm going to break into a Disney song. <laughs> Disney bad. All right, um, listen. <laughs> the goods and kindred go. This mortal life. My friends, so many of you are trying to live so that you don't die. When you don't realize the entire message of Christ is this, you have to die if you really want to live. So many of you are trying to suck every ounce of pleasure out of this life. You're trying to get as much joy and peace and happiness and satisfaction. You're trying to live as long as you can. You're trying to experience as much as you can. And what you need to understand is Jesus, not me. Jesus said, if you truly want to live, then first you must die. At the end of the day. I look at the things that so many people are chasing after today, and it breaks my heart. Because, my friends, there is no academic nor athletic accomplishment that you can ever take with you to heaven. There is no professional accomplishment that you can ever take with you to heaven. There is no world travel that you get to take with you to heaven. There is no 
experience in this life that you can take with let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. Why? His kingdom is forever. It was easy for David to say that. He was king. It was easy for these sons of Korah. They worked in the temple. It was easy for Martin Luther. He was a fancy professor. But what about me? I'm just trying to make my way. I'm just trying to get through. What does it mean for me? I'll tell you what it means for you. It means for you, you need to listen to the words of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added unto you. Seek first his kingdom. What do I mean by his kingdom? I mean the establishment of God's righteous rule in every area of your life. And my biggest fear in the church today is this. Musicians, would you come? Because if you start moving, I'll stop talking. Listen, my biggest fear in the church today is this. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. That some of you think that you're getting Jesus as a Savior, but you've never made him Lord of your life. And I know that a lot of you don't want to experience the consequences and the condemnation that come from living a life apart from Christ. But I'm here to tell you by the authority of the word of God today, it's only when you make Jesus the Lord of your life that you get to experience him as a savior of your life. That means his righteous rule should envelop and invade every area of your life. He's not just here to keep you out of hell. He's not just here to heal your body. He's not just here to set you free from problems. He's here to establish his righteous rule in your life. And that means every area of your life's got to be surrendered. Your family, your finances, your future, your faith, everything has got to be surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Listen, everything that you're seeing today is just temporary. Only his kingdom's eternal. So what's the worst thing that can happen to you in this world? Maybe you'd say, listen, death is the worst thing that could happen to me. Death is by far the worst thing that could happen to me. And some of you are so afraid of death. No, listen, death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you will die and never understand what it meant to truly live. What shall it profit a man? He gains the whole world and yet loses his soul. And so I ask you today, where are you resting? Where are you running to? What are you relying upon? Can you, like the sons of Korah and Martin Luther, stand here today and say, my God, my God, he's a refuge for me. He's a strength for me. He's a very present help in all times of trouble. Therefore, I don't need to be afraid. Mountains can throw themselves into the sea. The seas can foam and roar. It doesn't matter to me because I know my God. Can you say that today?